Today I'm going to talk a little bit about Hyperledger Iroha, what it is, how it enables CBDC and fintech use cases, and also um, future plans for DeFi. So just a quick introduction. My name is Makoto Takemiya. I'm a naturalized Japanese citizen. Um, I'm co-founder and CEO of Sorimitsu. So we're a fintech company uh, specializing in blockchain technology. Um, I'm a computer scientist by background, and I got a PhD in uh, in interdisciplinary information studies from the University of Tokyo. And um, my company is uh, Sormitsu. We're one of the contributors to Iroha uh, since 2016. So it's been quite a while. And we're a pretty global and distributed uh, company. Uh, but we specialize only on uh, blockchain, not on other things. Um, besides Iroha, we, we do some work um, also with Ursa as well. And uh, in the Polkadot ecosystem, we do quite a lot, and um, we do quite a lot of different things. So um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about Idraha and use cases, especially with the National Bank of Cambodia. Uh, but we also have other projects we're working on. We're working on a cross-border CSD RTGS linkage uh, prototype. Um, actually, Fujitsu, who's also here at the event, is, um, is one of the participants in this. and. Uh, uh, Besides this type of enterprise work, we do a lot of work in the public cryptocurrency space. So contributing to a cryptocurrency project called Sora and a Pokeswap uh, that's in the Polkadot ecosystem. So if you're interested in this, feel free to ask me later. Let's talk a little bit about what is Hyperledger Iroha, because you may not know. Um, Iroha is a platform that aims to have Byzantine fault tolerance and make it very easy to do common use cases by having uh, robust libraries and, uh, and core commands that can make it easy to, to do simple things. In Iroha 1, uh, that was started in 2016, um, it was written in C++. And rather than having a Turing complete smart contract functionality, it just had a library predefined commands that could be used for many financial use cases. So for example, CBDC. That has its pros and cons, of course. Um, by not having smart contracts per se, uh, Iroha 1 uh, reduced the attack space that you could do. So there's you know, just predefined commands. So it's, that's all you, you can manage. So if you test that, you can prove that it's um, safe. Uh, but it, it is kind of limiting. So in Iroha 2, we expand this to have a Turing complete smart contract functionality um, using WASM or WebAssembly. And uh, Iroha 2 is written in Rust rather than in C++. And it has, it, but it does continue the Iroha version one um, kind of concept or philosophy of having a robust internal library of predefined functions that can be used for simple th use cases like minting and transferring assets, for instance. So it's great for a payments use case. Uh, also, Iroha 2 has really exciting features like uh, event-driven uh, triggers that can execute certain code on an event. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about this today. But first, I'm going to talk about a few of the case, uh, a few of the use cases that we uh, worked on with Iroha version one. So the first one I'll talk about is a digital identity use case, um, and I'm not going to go into the details. But uh, this was actually published in a uh, paper in IEEE called uh, Sora Identity, and um, this was, um, I think, in 2017 we published this. But for digital identity, it. Uh, we experimented with use cases using a decentralized identifiers working with a bank Central Asia in Indonesia uh, to build a prototype uh, identity solution. And this was done s several years ago, but uh, the key point is that um, we use a, a blockchain platform that is running Iroha that uh, each of the group companies would run a node in the prototype. And then uh, the verifiable uh, validated uh, the verifiable claims about a decentralized identifier were um, written into the blockchain, and then uh, all, all the the nodes could get access to this information in a in a way that stored the provenance of how the data was um, introduced into the system. So the, the goal of this was to create kind of a standardized group identity, because um, like many large financial groups, there's no standard identity for all uh, all clients across the group. And uh, we built this prototype, and I don't have a, a, a link to the paper on the slides, but we wrote a paper called Sora Identity. So if you're interested in a d digital identity and DID concept, you can write this. 
But in Iroha 1 and Iroha 2, we allow uh, metadata to be associated with an account. So it's an easy way to add um, claims about an account uh, directly into the blockchain. Another use case that we explored in Iroha version 1 was uh, weather derivatives for insurance contracts. So uh, the use case is like if you have a big concert outside and if it rains, it gets canceled and so you have a big financial loss. So what you can do is you can hedge against this loss by buying um, from Sonpo Japan. You can buy this weather derivative contract where <clears throat> if it rains, uh, you get your, you know, some amount of money. And if it doesn't rain, you don't get anything. And um, so we programmed this in the blockchain uh, in, in a way similar to Iderha version 2 triggers, but Iderha version 1, you know, doesn't have this functionality, but we added it for this proof of concept. And really what it has is uh, we wrote, we used an oracle to write uh, weather data about a given location uh, into the blockchain at some fixed time interval. And then if there was rain, then as some code would be executed automatically on chain that transferred money from an account to the, uh, the customer. So it was an automatic payout. So this was just a, a way to simplify or optimize the workflow for an insurance uh, contract like this. So that was um, something that we did back in 2016. So it was <laughs> quite a while ago, 2016, 2017. And um, that used uh, Iroha version one. It's one of the first use cases of uh, Iroha version one, in fact. Um, but this was also an inspiration for the trigger design in Iroha version two, which I'll talk about later. Another cool example we did in uh, 2016 was uh, Moika. Moika is an event digital currency that we did in Japan in, uh, in Aizu Wakamatsu, which is in Fukushima prefecture. And uh, what it was, uh, it was a currency, like a cryptocurrency, but it was only for a closed event and it only lasted one day. And if you would, uh, if you meet somebody, you can shake your phone and they shake their phone. And then uh, there's, you know, some app that measure that, uh, well, you, you get a QR code that then you scan. So you have to be in front of the person and it only shows for a couple of seconds. So you have to do it really fast. But if you do that, it mints a new currency. So it's a way to mint a currency through social interaction because if you have like a, an event, you want people to communicate and meet each other. And so it, it was a way to kind of get people to, um, to talk to each other, especially uh, this was like an anime event in Japan. So people are not so, um, not so social usually. <laughs> so. Uh, so it's, a, it's re actually really successful and people had a lot of fun. And then there's uh, stores like a, selling popcorn or coffee uh, that you could exchange this uh, cryptocurrency for. Also, you could uh, earn this cryptocurrency by picking up trash and cleaning up uh, the event. So people did, the, did these things to get uh, this token. So it was a lot of fun. And this was a great use case for Iroha version 1, showing that uh, how simple it was to just create a currency and then exchange it. Um, you transfer to other users. And uh, this was expanded from this event to be uh, used in, in the campus of, Aizu Wakam, of uh, University of Aizu in, in Aizu Wakamatsu. So uh, this is uh, the Byako app and it launched um, in production in 2020. And it's been running ever since in the cafeteria and uh, the campus store. So. Uh, it's a prepaid type of system, so users would go to the campus store and pay some money, and then they get, um, you know, these tokens that then they can use at the campus store and the, uh, uh, the, the cafeteria to buy food. And the motivation for doing this is if you pay with the system, you get a, a slight discount um, on food that you buy. So this, uh, this was a replacement for physical, like, magnetic stripe cards that they used to have. So. Uh, before this system, users would have to go get this card and, and charge that up. And if they lose the card, they, they lose it. But uh, here, they just have it on their phone, and it's really simple and fast. And this uh, has been running uh, since 2020 um, with, uh, with Iroha version 1. And uh, so that's in like the local context. But then another great use case, I'm going to go into more detail with uh, is uh, Bakong, which is a central bank digital currency. So the CBDC, of course, is, um, I mean, it's, it's nothing that new because central banks already have digital currencies, but the point of this is it allows access to, um, to retail customers and also uh, the 
payment system is not a messaging system like uh, traditional payment systems, but it is actually like a payment system that transfers value rather than uh, just a message about uh, value changes. So we've been working on this in Cambodia and it launched in 2019 with Real Money as a pilot and then 2020 as a production system. So since the system is running today, um, I think it's best to show it just to kind of show that this can actually work in production. So yeah, we can see my phone. Here, I can be cool like Steve Jobs. Um, <laughs> so this is, uh, this is the wallet and uh, there's two currencies in the wallet. There's a US dollar and Khmer Real um, because Cambodia is a heavily dollarized country, so many transactions, actually vast majority of transactions are in US dollar. Um, and uh, as a customer, even though I'm transacting, and I'll talk about the architecture later, but the central bank is running uh, the blockchain system, even though I'm tr transacting on the central bank's ledger, um, I'm intermediated by a commercial bank. So you can see FTB logo up there, that's Foreign Trade Bank of Cambodia. So it's really a simple app. There's just four features, send, receive, uh, scanning QR code and deposit. So to send money, um, I can choose one of the users and I can send some small amount of money like one uh, Khmer Real. It's one four thousandth of a dollar. And uh, let's hit confirm. And then, yeah, it's sent. So uh, yeah, it's already done too. So that's it. So that actually uh, got uh, transaction finality on Iderha version one, and um, it yeah, sent it from my account to this user's account at another bank. So uh, I'll talk about the architecture in just a moment, but it's uh, you know it's pretty fast. You can use it to actually buy things in stores, which is really cool. And recently they uh, they upgraded the system to interlink all the other payment systems in Cambodia through KHQR. So uh, it's a standardized QR code and. Backhaul kind of acts like the glue between different systems. And I, I, I will talk about the architecture. Okay, so let's get out of here. So, so I just showed a demo of the app, so you know how it works. There's also some desktop apps. So one of the key points of Idraha is we put a lot of um, emphasis on actually building a self-custodial library. So what that means is that um, if you have like a web app or a mobile app, you want to generate the key and do all the transaction signing on the client side. You don't want to send any private keys to servers. Like that's, you know, that would be bad for many reasons. So uh, on the app I just showed, the transaction is signed on my device and then just the signed transaction is sent to the, uh, the core system. And we have the same type of thing for desktop apps. So there are JavaScript libraries, um, libraries for Android, libraries for iOS, uh, and then Idraha version two has libraries for Rust that are um, able to sign, generate keys and sign transactions uh, locally. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the architecture of uh, Bakong because I do think it's potentially interesting. So Bakong is a two tier architecture. So what that means is that <clears throat> even though all the um, user accounts are on a shared ledger, uh, the end users intermediated by um, the commercial banks. And this is done for many reasons. One is privacy, because the central bank doesn't want to know the personally identifiable information of a user. And another is really just you know, from um, operational aspects, because the central bank is not providing customer support. <laughs> so, so they need to have someone like, um, like a commercial bank or payment service provider that uh, provides the support. Here's an, a, another view of the same architecture. So you have at the core, you have Hyperledger Idroha that is running as the kind of the ground truth of the world state. So who has what balance um, at, you know, at a given time. And every uh, bank sets up a payment gateway that then users like me, uh, my device connects to the payment gateway and not to the, the core system directly. So if I send a transaction, it goes to the gateway, the gateway then transmits it to Idraha, to one of the peers, and then uh, then gets finality, and then that comes back uh, to my device. And the commercial bank also as part of the payment gateway stores my personal information, like for you know, KYC uh, reasons. 
It also integrates with the core banking system. So you can do things like, uh, like you can withdraw from the Backlong system or charge up your balance from a, a traditional bank account because it, it, it interoperates with uh, traditional accounts. Um, Backlong is different from an e-money system because you know most e-money systems, at least in uh, in Asia, most of the time they work like this. So, you um, you'd have like a if you had like a prepaid system, like in Japan we have a Suica, right? Um, I think in London they have Oyster. Here in Ireland they have another um, analog of the same type of system. But you prepay uh, pre-charge it with some cash usually, um, and then you get some balance from the payment processor on your card. But then when you actually go to a store and spend the money, you're not actually making the payment, you're just sending a payment instruction that then maybe two to four weeks later, the store actually gets the money um, in their bank account. So there's like a time lag and um, that's not always convenient for stores because they have to manage cash flow and treasury. But with a CBDC system like Bakong, if you, you're basically digitizing the cash. So you can go to a bank, um, charge up your Bakong balance and you get uh, the Bakong money and then you make a payment to a store, they get the money instantly and they can reuse it um, or cash it out or do anything they want with it with just a few seconds, right? So that's, uh, that's really exciting and I do think this is the future and it's a, it's a way to easily make, um, you know, to facilitate payments and make uh, payment infrastructure more convenient in many countries. Um, some contextual reasons for those who are interested um, as to why Backlong was created. So uh, Cambodia has a large unbanked population. It's only around 22% of Cambodians have a bank account, like a proper bank account. Um, but they have a large money sending market. Uh, most of it's domestic because people will go uh, out of the countryside and go work in the capital and then send money back home. So it's, it's, it's a payment within the same country. But uh, traditionally, you know, there's no easy way to make this payment. So they would go to one of the payment operators and then they would hand them some cash and then, you know, get like a code that then you message to your friend. The friend takes the code and then goes pick up, picks up the cash at the, one of the stores. So it's, um, it's, it's kind of a cumbersome system that had a high transaction fee. And so a project like Bakong is, um, is made to reduce the, uh, the fees and costs associated with this. And also to enable new use cases in e-commerce because if people don't have credit cards or a way to pay digitally, um, it limits the types of transactions you can do. Uh, we used Ederhoff for this, um, mainly I would say because it creates a trust minimized system. So it's, it's very highly robust and from an operational standpoint, it's, it's kind of nice to use a blockchain because if one of the core ledger nodes goes down, like on a weekend, let's say, uh, you don't really have to go and set it up again instantly because you have enough redundancy built into the system that it just keeps running and you can go and set it up, you know, the ne next working day. And this makes operation much easier. And from a central bank standpoint, you really appreciate the, um, the robustness of the decentralized consensus because you have many different nodes that have to sign off on the data. It makes it very hard to hack a system like this because um, all the transactions are digitally signed. So you can't fake you know, any kind of transaction. It's just not possible. So it, it does make the system quite, uh, quite robust. Um, it also um, kind of distributes the responsibility because like I have my key on my phone, but um, no one else has my key. So even the central bank, um, I mean, they can, they can do other things for legal reasons, but they can't, uh, they can't sign a transaction on my behalf. So it does give some kind of, um, you know, mathematically provable uh, property ownership. Um, that being said, you know, it is, it is a central bank system. So at the end of the day, if there was like a legal sanction against somebody, they, um, they do have the ability to, you know, to take action via uh, the court system in the country. So uh, that's, that's more done on the uh, payment gateway side than on the core ledger though. And um, I mean, I'm a libertarian myself, so I kind of wish that um, everyone would just use public blockchains, but unfortunately, <laughs> Uh, the world we live in, you know, there are certain rules that, um, that have to be implemented. And so uh, we try to work with the central bank to design this in a way that doesn't violate anyone's 
privacy or property rights because you do have this clear separation of the responsibilities of the, of the banks, which manage their customers, and the central bank, which is managing just a balance um, updating infrastructure. So yeah, the system's been in many articles. Um, like I said, it pilot launched in 2019 and officially launched in 2020. And it's been yeah, just running for several years now. Um, we won several awards actually on this. Uh, so from the Journal of Central Banking, from the Japan Financial Innovation Award, and the Nikkei Asia Award uh, for the system. So it's gotten pretty good uh, response. Um, these are data from the last, last two years, so from the launch and then also in 2021. And uh, in 2021, there were two, uh, almost $3 billion in transaction volume and 8 million transactions um, that were processed in 2021. And um, this year is much, much higher. So maybe 10 times this, I don't know the exact number. So, uh, but in between 2020 and 2021, these bars are not to scale, <laughs> but um, yeah, transaction volume in KHR went up 62 times and uh, USD went up 95 times. So um, it's really quite um, quite exciting. And this is getting even, uh, Backlong is getting even more use because of the integration to the standardized QR system that launched in July called KHQR. And this allows any of the banking apps to scan the standard QR code and behind the scenes it will do the routing. <coughs> and a lot of the interbank payments are going through Backlong because um, Backlong doesn't have any, um, you know, the fees are cheaper compared to other systems. So if I have like a ABA bank app, I can scan the QR code uh, for somebody at, um, let's say, Vatanak Bank. And then behind the scenes, it can convert to Backlong, send it to Vatanak, and then convert to their, um, you know, on, to their balance. Because the Backlong is a central bank money, so it can be used in settlement with, uh, with no counterparty risk because, it, well, people trust the central bank. Um, for a system like this, there are no negative effects on monetary policy, I would say. So what we've observed over the past two years is that, so I'll just step back and say that a lot of, um, especially European central banks are very scared about competition between CBDC and, uh, and banks, uh, commercial banks. And that's because <clears throat> there's a lot of talk about opening up direct accounts um, on a central bank's ledger. Now that would be competition, but in Cambodia it's actually, um, even though I'm opening an account on the central bank's ledger, I'm intermediated by one of the commercial banks or the P PSP, right? So, so really, uh, because these are non-interest bearing accounts, um, it, it doesn't really give me a, a big motivation to store a lot of money um, in this account. So it's really more of like just a replacement for pocket change that you would use uh, physical cash for anyway. So it's for daily payments, it's not really, for savings, I would say. People who have lots of money, they use traditional bank account, especially in Cambodia where you can get 5% interest paid on your savings. So um, people people don't really store large amounts of money in Bakong is what we've observed over the past two years. Um, and it's more for you know small uh, transactions and also as a payment rails for uh, wholesale payments between banks. So I would say there's no negative effects. And there's lots of positive effects too, because it acts like the glue to integrate all these different you know, payment apps across all the different banks. And that's really exciting because um, users shouldn't have to think about you know, what app is the store using. <laughs> you know, just signing an app is, makes it very easy. And what's really exciting is that there's integration work being done with a prompt pay in Thailand. So people will be able to then go to um, Thailand with the Backlong app and, and make a payment, and then it will convert behind the scenes to Thai bot and send it across um, the prompt pay network. So that, and because prompt pay is also used in Laos, um, you, you can kind of use the same app in three countries, which is really cool. There's also some cool use cases for cross-border use. Um, so Backlong is, uh, uh, is used for cross-border uh, payments from Malaysia to Cambodia uh, via Maybank. So Maybank has branch offices in both countries. So in Kuala Lumpur, you can go to Maybank um, uh, 
office and you can convert dollar or convert I guess ringgit to dollars in uh, Vakong system then you can send it to uh, somebody in Cambodia so this is really great because you don't just send it to somebody's um, you know bank account but you can also make uh, payments directly to any Vakong user um, and in theory because KHQR is standardized now you can make a payment to any anyone uh, in the payments network in Cambodia uh, from Malaysia like directly so this has used cases for empowering especially women who go out of Cambodia and go to work in um, Malaysia, like in a hospitality use, uh, you know, field is very common. So instead of uh, sending money to a relative, having to trust them and then having the money paid for like schools or hospitals or things, they could just pay directly to the school or for whatever use case. So it gives more empowerment over people's finances and their assets. Um, Japanese government is also kind enough to sponsor our uh, research in uh, the Lao PDR as well. And uh, we just finished the first stage of this work, and um, so that's quite exciting. And we've been doing a CBDC physical, uh, feasibility study as well in, uh, in Oceania region. So um, I guess Fiji, Tonga, Vanuatu, Solomon Islands, uh, Vietnam and Philippines. So lots of um, work. This is mainly just... Um, market research to kind of uh, kind of study to see how would a CBDC fit into the payments infrastructure in these countries as a initial work and then we can make like some specific uh, proposal to the to the central banks in these countries so um, so that's some of the use cases that uh, I've had the pleasure to work on over the last few years and with the remaining time I kind of want to go into some of this specifics of Iroha 2 and why it's, it's kind of cool. And to, because this is uh, listed in the program as a technical talk, um, I want to go into some details. So, um, so Iroha version 2 um, has a very uh, simple object model that, uh, same as version 1 really, um, you have the concept of a domain, an account, and an asset. And as you can see in this, in this diagram here, a domain, um, acts like a box that you can put accounts in, you can put assets uh, in, and the, uh, the assets can be owned by accounts. So it's a, it, it's a very simple object model, but these are basic primitives that, um, that are important to think about because uh, this helps to standardize uh, the assets in a ledger. So if you don't have this, then you end up with something like Ethereum where um, for instance, even if you have an ERC-20 token, the specific implementation of the contract can be different. So um, like some uh, ERC-20 contracts uh, refer to failed transactions, some emit events, um, or some return false and don't emit events. <laughs> so you have to handle all these special cases in Ethereum because there's no asset standardization, even though there's like a, kind of a loose standard. But Iroha uh, actually standardizes how you represent a, a like an, an, an asset. An asset is like, you know, some kind of uh, point or currency or it could be, um, you know, non-fungible token, like something like that, something that is owned. And uh, the way, it, uh, we also have a really robust um, way to add uh, different metadata and other types of data. So this is a little bit small, let me zoom in. So I can't actually zoom in more than 400, that's too bad. Hmm. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, it, in a domain, for instance, um, a domain has accounts, it has asset definitions, and it also has this metadata field. So you can add other types of metadata associated with the domain. Um, this could be, you know, really anything. So some kind of like, um, you know, key value model um, you can add uh, to represent any kind of, uh, annotation about what a domain is. We also have this logo field too, that's to help um, like uh, data viewers to be able to, um, in a decentralized way, show information about the, the data on chain. So sometimes you would want um, like logo data. This is optional, of course. Domain has accounts. So what that means is that all accounts on the chain are associated with some domain and they can inherit uh, some properties from the domain too, like permissions. Um, and accounts have assets, and they have signatories. So this builds the concept of a multi-signature account directly into the, um, into the data model. 
So you can have multiple signatories on an account. And, uh, and you can have some threshold of how many of these signatories um, you need to, uh, to make a transaction. For example, if you have like three keys th for signing, out of the three keys, <clears throat> you can have like requirement for two of the keys to, um, to have signed a transaction for it to be validated. Again, you can also put metadata on an account. So this is really useful for decentralized identity use cases because you can make a verifiable or validatable claims about an account and also um, uh, calculate the decentralized identifiers and put them associated with the account directly on chain. Then you've got assets and asset definitions. Asset definition is just, you know, uh, kind of holding some of the, um, the type data about the asset and then the asset itself is the uh, kind of the quantity information about how many of this asset uh, specific account owns. And there's lots of options that you can play with. It's made, it's made to be really uh, robust out of the box. So you don't have to write all this logic yourself if you're trying to do common asset use cases. Um, one thing that may also uh, make it easy to kind of see how um, the data model works is um, taking a look at a, an example Genesis uh, block. So uh, in the Genesis block, you can have this optionally, you can have a definition of some assets and users uh, right in the, uh, the first block. And I was hoping actually to zoom in more than 400%, but um, anyway, it is what it is. So <coughs> I'll just read it through in case you can't read this. So. Um, what you have in the Genesis block is a very simple definition in JSON where you have a list of transactions that are executed in order. And you have um, ISIs, which I'll talk about in the next slide actually. And uh, so in Idraw2, we have a list of um, predefined kind of commands like a library. And these are called ISIs or Idraw special instructions. The idea is it's similar to how CPU has an instruction set that is predefined. And these are just high level instructions like a register, like, um, like a mint, uh, like I think there's a, a, a demint or burn type of instruction too. So here's an example of um, registering a new domain called Wonderland. So there's a lot of wrapping and stuff um, that hopefully will be simplified in the future. But um, what you have is the register ISI that says register. And then you create an object and it's an identifiable ENSA domain, and it has the name Wonderland. And at the beginning, when you first register, it has no accounts or assets. But once you register the domain in this transaction, you can define the next transaction, which is uh, registering a new account called Alice in the domain Wonderland. And Alice has a signatory, just one signatory here. This is a public key. So it, um, it uses the Twisted Edwards curve, ED, and then uh, then has the public key uh, bytes um, here. So you could have actually multiple signatories here if you wanted to have a multi-signature account. So it's a really easy way to make multi-sig accounts. And then you can also register an asset definition. So here's an asset definition. So register, object, asset definition, name is Rose, and it's in the domain Wonderland. And uh, you can just uh, create the asset definition. Then you can mint some roses. So you call the mint instruction, and it's for the asset definition rose in domain Wonderland. And um, you give it to an account ID Alice in the domain Wonderland, and you mint 13 of these roses. So it's um, <laughs> a little bit verbose, uh, but this is you know, the predefined genesis block that kind of starts up the system. And in the future, I think it'll be uh, a little bit simplified. Um, using something like the Python library also makes it easier uh, to write this. But this is showing an example of, um, of, of, an, of how the ISIs work. So the pre, this pre-built library is really robust. So you can create many different types of um, accounts and um, assets right out of the box without having to do anything complex. And because it's written right into the core, um, the data flow is really optimized for these. So it's, it can be made very fast. Here's some more examples of the ISIs. So this is using the REST library. Um, so I, I mean, I kind of simplified it a little bit, but 
um, you can create this domain uh, looking glass and then inside of looking glass. So once you create the domain, um, you, uh, you can build the transaction using the library, then submit the transaction. So it's really easy to just you know, write some code as a client and uh, submit it directly to one of the peers on your network. And, um, and it just takes a few seconds. And once you have this uh, domain looking glass, you can register a new account, white rabbit at looking glass. So th this is um, kind of like an optional, well, I'm not sure if it's optional yet. It will be in the future at least, this, uh, this type of named account structure. So uh, this was also used in Iroha 1 where you had a domain and uh, account model and every, um, every account is kind of given some name. And, uh, but in the future, this is going to be an optional name, but it can be simple or useful for some use cases to be able to say, hey, I want to send money to White Rabbit at Looking Glass. It's like an email address type of structure. Um, but you can also send uh, directly to other types of identifiers in the future, or maybe even now. I'm not sure if it's finished yet, actually, so I, I should check. Um, so uh, ISIs are nice, but there's also, um, you know, whole universe of possibilities out there. So you want to also be able to um, execute arbitrary code. And that's really where, where Wasm uh, helps. So Wasm is WebAssembly. We use um, Wasm VM to safely run uh, executable code. And we have uh, some interfaces so you can, um, you can call the object model inside of your Wasm contracts. So here's an example of a use case where you, you query, you find all the domains in the system. So you just say, give me all the domains and uh, you get this vector and then for each domain you add, uh, you add a new account <laughs> called Mad Hatter. So you basically uh, loop through all the domains, you add uh, a new account to all the domains and then uh, you register this. Um, that's what the register instruction down here does. So you can call the ISIs inside of your WASM contracts and this is how you um, update the world state. So this is a, a silly example but um, it kind of shows you how it's really easy to do um, these types of things with the ISI framework. And um, because you can write this code in any language that compiles to Wasm, like a Wasm blob, um, it gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, I mean, you do have to have the libraries uh, built for it, of course. And then finally, um, I want to talk a little bit about an exciting feature called triggers. So triggers are quite complex and I can't go into all the details now, but uh, it allows you to execute some, some code or an action um, on an event that's emitted. So uh, when you uh, execute certain types of events in Iroha, you get an event that's emitted and you can listen to these events. So here's an, a silly example, but um, it allows you to uh, create a trigger. So you register a, a trigger um, called refresh t. And this trigger, when it's executed, the executable here um, it creates a T asset and of quantity one and transfers it um, to Alice from the Mad Hatter. So what this does is uh, when, the, um, when Alice reduces the, well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the event here in a moment, but what it's supposed to do is when the asset drinks some tea, she gets more tea from the Mad Hatter. So when the asset in her account reduces, she gets more sent to her. So the way it works is there's, um, it's easier to look on my screen here. Um, so when the, uh, so you have this trigger that repeats indefinitely that is um, looking for some event that is uh, asset event filter uh, remove. It says by remove. So when uh, the asset you're looking for is removed from an account. Um, you get uh, this event that's matched and then you send, um, you execute the executable which sends the T from Mad Hatter to Alice. So it's a silly example, but it, it shows you how you can um, listen to certain events and then execute some action. This could be used for paying like automated transaction taxes in the CBDC context or doing really any kind of cool uh, things. Since I have few seconds left, I'm going to say for the future, uh, we want to um, also expand Iroha 2 to work more in the decentralized context. So using a nominated proof of stake uh, type of consensus um, will allow us to set up public blockchain networks that can be used for DeFi apps. And 
I think this uh, model with the uh, event triggers and wasm blobs uh, execution can make for really cool um, apps and we would like to see if this can be used to work on uh, other projects that we contribute to like the Sora network and the Pokeswap DEX which is an on-chain decentralized exchange because this type of trigger um, execution model can really open up new possibilities for DeFi and uh, let you do cool things. And uh, with that, I'm out of time, but if you want to get started with Iroha 2, please check out um, the, the docs, which are at the Hyperledger GitHub here. And uh, you can also go to GitHub slash uh, Hyperledger uh, uh, for the uh, namespace and then Iroha, uh, if you can find the Iroha um, GitHub repository. So uh, yeah, please check it out. And um, I'm happy to take any questions uh, outside of the room right now. So we're out of time. So thank you for your time and for coming.